Hi there, my name's Vince from MyMateVince.com and in this video today it's another trying to fix video. Another video where I've bought something faulty off eBay and I'm going to do my best to fix it. And this time we've gone old school, back to the 1980s. Here we have it, a Nintendo Entertainment System. Now the seller that I've bought from, his name is Danny, I've bought from him quite a few times before but I haven't got around to doing all the videos yet. So if you watched the one where I repaired the Atari 2600 in the eBay challenge with Steve from Tronics Fix, then I bought from, that was from him, and as you've seen, it was uh, repairable. So the good thing is, I know he's honest, and he describes the proper faults. So for example, if it was water damaged, he would say it's water damaged. He wouldn't say, don't know what's wrong with it, untested. So I like buying from him, because at least I know what I'm getting. Now, this one here, I bought for £20 and it comes with a power supply, an RF lead and also a controller here. Let me show you the listing. So it was up for £25 but he always gives me a little bit of a deal so I got it for £20 and it just says here for sale. NES console that is faulty for the following reasons. I got it as having flash I got it as having flashing red lights, so I cleaned the cartridge slot and disabled lockout chip, but now it only displays grey screen. Comes with 40 power supply which will not power on at all and an RF lead. What you see in the pick is what you get, and due to the listed faults and potentially potentially others, no refunds, replacement or bad feedback accepted. Console and power supply are for specialist repair or parts only. Thanks for looking. Right, well I'm not sure if I'm going to be that specialist, but I will give it my very best shot. Now, I have got another NES, so it means Nintendo Entertainment System, NES. It means that I can actually use a power supply from that, because I probably won't be getting too involved with the power supply, because normally these things are kind of moulded. It looks like there's I don't know, it looks like you might be able to get into it from here, but it looks like there's some kind of weird, I don't know whether it, it would have been like some rubber seal or some wax seal or something like that. So unless, for example, it's just a dodgy fuse in here, I don't think I'm really going to be mucking about with the power supply. But that's not a big deal because you can buy those things off eBay relatively cheaply. It's this that I'm interested in. Now, I am new to any sort of modding on the NES, but I believe the lockout chip, I believe that's there so that you can't, so it's kind of region locked, so for example you can only play games from your region. I don't know whether that would be UK or Europe, but I'm thinking if you were to get an American game now it wouldn't work in a UK or a Europe model. Could be wrong. I think it's also to stop dodgy software, you know like pirated software and stuff like that. So an easy way of doing it is I think you lift one of the legs, I'm not sure if it's pin 4 or something from memory, I think I read that and then it's supposed to work and it's also supposed to work better with dirty cartridges but I know it sounds silly uh, I mean I don't know the case in this one yet I need to open it up and have a look but if that leg is still there I'd be tempted to actually put it back to make it all original but not that it really matters but the thing is it's not working anyway so let's take it apart well first of all let's test it and then we're gonna take it apart and see what is the problem with it, see if it is fixable or not. Now I'm hoping something like this might be easier to get my head round than for example an Xbox One or a PlayStation 4. So it should be fun. So let me get another power supply and let's see what's wrong with this thing. Right, okay, let's uh, plug in everything into it. I'm just gonna try the 40 power supply to begin with, just to see what's happening. Now the TV should be tuned into the correct channel already. Okay, that is the wrong lead for my TV. So let me get another lead. Let's turn it on and see if we have anything. Okay, so there's definitely no power there at all. So let's have a look at this power supply. And let's see if it, sure it's not going to be a fuse, but let's just eliminate that because it's a nice easy thing to do. This part of the lead is very short, this bit here, which is a bit odd. I would expect that to be a lot longer.
ever ready. Wow, 13 amp, that seems quite high as well. Yeah, it should be a 3 amp. But again, that's not going to stop it from working, it's just safety. I'll have to, if I was to get that working, I'd have to change it. But I don't think I'm going to be successful with the power supply. Right, so I've got this set to continuity. Right, okay, so the fuse itself is okay. Let's pop that back in. Now, let's check for voltage coming out of it. Ah, look, it says here. Now, maybe it's compatible with, with both. I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up okay, but it says here, look, warning. Uh, no, sorry, there we go. Power supply for use with Super NES control deck only. So the uh, Super NES is the SNES, isn't it? Okay, well, let's have a look. This output's 9 volts at 1.3 amps. 9 volts at 1.3 amps. Let's see what this working power supply does. 9 volts at 1.3 amps. Right, okay. Well, I've got... Oh, actually, sorry, my working power supply's got a really short lead as well. You can tell how old this one is because, look, it hasn't even got the sleeves around the live and the neutrals. So, basically, this plug now wouldn't be allowed to uh, make an item with this on anymore because have a look at the newer style plug can you see it's got a sleeve round here so in theory if you were a young child you could put this in and I think it could get live uh, if you had very small fingers it could get live and you could touch your fingers on it or maybe not maybe not so much your fingers but let's say if you've got a screwdriver or something when you plug this in as you start to unplug it it would disconnect by the time you have a chance to reach onto the copper or the brass or whatever this is but with this one here you see you could unplug it and it could still be connected and touch it here so you're not allowed these anymore right, let's see if we have any voltage coming out of this oh that's interesting the output is AC not DC so it says AC, is that the same with this one? Output AC, 9 volts, yeah, okay. Right, so let's put it to AC. Let's see if we have anything in here. No, we don't. No, it's just saying 0.4 of a volt. Right, let's plug in our other power supply. Yeah, there you go, so the working one is outputting 11 volts. I didn't zoom in on my meter, so you might not be able to see that. So obviously there's definitely a problem with the power supply, which I don't think, in my opinion, is gonna be fixable. I really wouldn't wanna be tampering, tampering with it, just in case it didn't go back together properly, and then let's say if it came apart in the future, then obviously somebody could get a 240 volt shock and end up killing themselves. So I think with this one, that's uh, best to be just thrown away. I can take the fuse out of it, reuse that, but that's about it. Right, so as far as this video is concerned, I'm just going to be operating it using my power supply here. Okay, so the power's on there. There's, the light's not flashing, but that's because uh, there's no game in it and that lockout chip... I presume when the lockout chip is done, then the, the light will just stay on. So let's turn that off and let's get a game in. It's such a nice action of putting it in and pressing it down. It's just lovely, I really like that. Well, okay, I know I'm on the correct channel there and nothing's displaying on the screen up there. Let's just try another game. No, 
No. Right, what I'm going to do before I'm going to muck about with anything else is I'm going to get some AV leads and I'm going to try the AV leads out of here just in case there's a problem with the RF side of things because this unit in here could be faulty, couldn't it? So let me get some AV leads and let's see what happens then. Right, let's pop this lead in. Right, let's see if that makes a difference, just in case it is a problem with the RF. Let's have a look now. Turn on AV. Turn it on. Okay. Uh... Right, well that is a more interesting screen. I'm just wondering why on the RF it didn't... Surely it's going to have the same RF sort of tuner as my NES. There we go. That one's working. So, right, why is that one working and Pro Am's not? Is it just a bad? Is it just? I don't know. Turn it off. Is it just going to be dirty contacts? Just try pushing it in and out a few times. That's weird. Why would it work with one game and not another game? And I know this game works because it works on my one. Do certain games use different contacts? Possibly. Right, well, I mean, it's good that Duck Hunt works, it's just a bit odd why it works. Yeah, that works. Cons ah, didn't work that time. Didn't work that time. I think it's going to be a bad contact in the, uh, you know, the, the female part of it. So let's call this the male part. I think it's going to be a bad contact in the female, female part. There we go, working. Right, okay. Uh, I think I'm going to take it apart and clean it because it seems to be very hit and miss, doesn't it? There you go. See, it didn't work that time, and I, I don't want that. I want it to be. Able, I want it to work every single time. Yeah, because there's nothing worse than playing the games where you have to go in, out a millimeter, in, out. You know, shaking it all about. That's just annoying because when you want to play a game, you just want to play a game and it, you're not going to want to play this if you know you have to mess around for five minutes every single time. So, right, it's good that it's, uh, it's good that it is working, but let's get it working so it's doing it all the time. Now, I just want to double check what's going on with this RF lead as well. So, just a bit concerned why. I'm going to put Duck Hunt on because I know that works and then I'm going to go on to the RF and see if I can get that working. Yeah, it's very hit and miss, isn't it? There we go, and that's all there, uh, pixelated. There we go. Well, actually, I can just leave that in there, can't I? And then take this out. Put the RF back in. And let's see what's happening. Let's see if it's working now. Ah, oh, there it is, but it's a very poor picture. Let's try to fine tune that a bit. Right, well, something isn't right there, is it? So it's working on. That's not right, it's working on AV, but it's not working properly when it comes to the RF. 
So I'm going to have to look into look into that as well. I'm not sure whether that's going to be something that I can solve or not. But anyway, we uh, we can do our fault finding to begin with on AV, and then we can worry about the RF afterwards. So yeah, I think this is going to be an interesting one because there's a few things to sort out. Yeah, see, that's what it should look like. Right, okay, let's take this thing apart and let's try to get it working consistently. And then we can worry about the RF side of things. Right, it just looks like there's six screws around the edge here. I'm not sure if I have to undo these or not. So let's get the camera in a little bit closer so you can see what's going on. Right, there's six screws out, let's see. What this thing looks like. Now I've never taken one of these apart before. So it's gonna be quite interesting. Look at the size of that capacitor there. Absolutely huge. Right, okay, so we have to take apart I want to get into that connector where the cartridge just goes into. So let's take off this shield here. Right, that all came off nicely. Looks like it's very well made. And look at that mechanism, still working perfectly after all these years. 30 something years, 30 something years ago. Very nice. Right, let's uh, take off this bit here, I think, because I still can't really get proper access to that, can I? Right, okay, so that comes out like that. So now that gives me access to here to try and sort out what's going on. To be fair, it looks very clean. Okay, so when you put it in, it's only reading one... Is it just reading one side of the cart then? So why do we have contacts on both sides? Why do we have contacts on both sides if the pins are only reading one. Oh actually there is ones up top as well, there is. So maybe it's the ones up top that are not working, uh, not doing very well. Oh so I suppose you put it in like that and then when you go down it then joins all the contacts together. Right, okay. I mean, it all looks very clean. Let's have a look at this lockout chip, see if it's, uh, see what it looks like. So I'm pretty much free. I'm just gonna undo these connectors. Right, so as far as I know, I mean I haven't tested the controllers yet, but I'm hoping they're going to work. They look to be okay. And I know the power and the reset work, so I'm thinking that this side of it is all absolutely fine. It looks so nicely made, doesn't it? Oh, it's just lovely. Alright, let's have a look in here. See what's going on. There we go. Well, I can see the lockout chip, and I won't be able to. I won't be able to put that back on because it's been snapped from the actual top of the chip itself. Yeah, so that's it there. Right. Okay. Never mind. As I say, it's no, it's no harm anyway, is it? I think loads of people do it to it. So, and I think it's supposed to work better with dirty cartridges, maybe because it's not looking for that kind of like maybe certain pins have to chat to this chip or something or that particular pin so I suppose if it's not connected there's more chance of it working wonder what this thing is here 
corresponds to there. Oh, so once upon a time they must have, maybe they were going to do some kind of expansion thing in here to add something more to it. Right, okay. Well, everything looks okay, everything looks nice and clean, I can't see any corrosion anywhere. Now, I'm not sure why this isn't working properly here, so we're going to have to look into that. It looks like it's soldered onto the board here. I mean, I don't know whether I can, I suppose I can get access to this by just lifting the lids off. But I don't think I'm going to worry about that just yet. Let's get it, let's get it working consistently to begin with, and then we can think about the RF side of it. There we go. I bet you can even buy these boards here relatively cheaply if you needed to. Right, okay, well, the only thing I can really see, but it's not going to actually affect the cart itself, but if you look closely on these bits here, you can definitely see that it's kind of got, I don't know whether it's been cleaned with a tissue or whether it's just a little bit of corrosion, but if you have a look, can you see white bits here, here, here? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get IPA, and a flux brush or you could use a toothbrush and I'm just going to go up and down here numerous times to try to clean it out and uh, see if that's going to make a difference so it looks like one set of contacts goes onto the bottom here and then they go up to here do you know what I need to have a really close look because I don't actually know if there is contacts up the top I thought I seen them earlier but now I'm not so sure uh, are all these soldered on? Are all these bottom ones soldered onto here? No, they're not. Look, that's just a push fit. Look at that. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Again, look, I can see a little bit of tissue or something just here. There. Well, that's perfect. Well, that gives me an opportunity now to give it a really good clean because maybe there's just a corrosion on some of these pins here but more than likely because it did work I said there's going to be a little bit of a bad contact somewhere along here maybe a slight bent pin or maybe just a little bit of corrosion but while I've got this off now it gives me an opportunity to give this a nice clean and I could even rub the fiberglass brush just up and down it a tiny bit just to get rid of any little bit of tarnish so that's what I'm going to do now I'm going to get some gloves on and get cleaning. Okay, so all I'm going to be doing is rubbing the fiberglass pen gently on these contacts here. Just to give you an example, I'm sure the problem isn't down here, but if you can see, you know, they look a little bit not tarnished, but you can just see where the other contacts have been rubbing up and down it. So if I was to do this now, look at the difference. There, can you see? Yeah. Let's do another one. Let's do the one next to it here. Yeah, this one here. Yeah, so that should make a nice smooth contact again. So I'm going to be doing that on each of them and uh, cleaning it with IPA. Okay, that's interesting. So basically, all the contacts on this side here have little traces going to them. It looks wet because I've just put IPA on it. And uh, the contacts on the other side, can you see, don't go anywhere, just to these little dots here, which then, well, okay, well, these go somewhere. But all these ones here, they go straight through the board onto these dots here, which then have the other traces going to them. And some of these dots look like they have tiny kind of pinholes in them. I mean, if you look at these two here, look, one, two, three, four, five and six, these ones here. I wonder whether it'd be worth just tapping each of these with a soldering iron just to get it to, uh, just to fill up the holes a little bit, because obviously 
that's like going through the board, isn't it? So if one of them was a bit of a, a bad connection, maybe that wouldn't be too great. So I think I'm going to tap each of them. I know this isn't proving the fault, it's just that the fault's intermittent, isn't it? It just happens sometimes, well it happens most of the time, but not all the time. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to do a, a whole load of things to try and eliminate it. So I'm just going to reflow every one of these on both sides. So just all these, it won't take long, I'm just going to tap each of them. I'll have the temperature at uh, 300. I'm thinking this is going to be leaded solder here because of the age of it. So hopefully that will melt really quick. Let's see how it goes. No, it's not gonna not gonna melt that quick. Right, let's get some solder, and I'm just gonna tap it. I'm gonna put it up a little bit as well. I'm gonna put it up to three uh, 350, because if the board's quite quick, maybe it's gonna drain the heat away. And let me get a little bit of solder. Right, so I'm just gonna tap each of these with the solder. Actually, it's not going to take long now that I've got a, a blob on my uh, soldering iron. have to do now is I actually bridge some of them by accident so uh, to the actual contacts so now I'm gonna get a little bit of braid and just remove the tiny bits that went on to the contacts now what was interesting is one of these ones here it kind of just filled up a couple of times it was like it was hollow do you know what I mean well I, I know it's hollow but what I mean is it was like it really filled up so I wonder if one of them was a little bit if it didn't have enough soldering would it would that cause an issue possibly what I'm saying is when I tapped it it seemed to go flat and I tapped it again it seemed to go flat and then the third time it did a little mound so it was like there wasn't enough solder in it I'm not saying that is it but it just seemed a bit different than the others with this side now and I'm happy with that so none of those bits there are shorting anymore to these ones here because I've just cleaned away the solder so see this one here you can see a tiny little bit at the top well before that might have been like bridging to that dot there but it's not anymore so they all look okay the traces look like they're going off so I think I think that side's okay let's do this side now I'm gonna try to be a little bit more careful this side Actually, this side won't matter because each of these dots are going down onto the onto the uh, you know the big contacts anyway. I'll clean up this side, but I'm just doing it purely for neatness. Right, and that's that side done there.
So now I'm going to clean the thing that's probably actually causing the fall, and that's this bit in here. And while I'm here, I'm going to clean up the contacts on the games as well. Maybe if both games were perfectly clean, then it would have just worked perfectly from the beginning because maybe the game or the games that Danny were trying might have been a little bit on the dirty side. Or maybe it's a combination of both. Maybe if the games are not perfect and this connector here is just a little bit dirty, then maybe that's enough to stop it from working. I'm just doing this just to try to kind of like clean up both the game and also this connector here. I did look through this eyepiece here and yes, I mean you can see these bottom connectors here, but there's definitely top connectors here on, uh, I mean you can just see the tops of them here and then they loop round. So although I can see the ones here, I can't see the other ones there. So in theory, there could be one or two of them that might be slightly just a different level if they're bent ever so slightly then that could cause a connection problem well what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some thin cardboard and I'm going to wedge it in here and move it around the place to try and clean it up right so that's too thin so I'm just going to double it up That, that looks clean enough. Right, so I'm going to put this back on now. Right, well that's gone on very strongly there. I think let's temporarily put it back together. I won't put all the screws in and let's see how it's working. Well, I'm going to put a couple of the long screws just in here just to try to keep it in the correct position. Right, we're on AV, let's see how consistently it works. Let's start with Duck Hunt, which was the more successful one out of the two. So put it in, push it down, turn it on. No, not working. Right, okay. So I've made it, looks like I've made it worse. Right, it worked that time. Let's try the other game. I don't want it to be hit and miss, I just want it to work every single time. No. Now, that time I didn't do anything. All I did was, I didn't even adjust it, I just pushed it down. I just lifted it up and down. I mean, I wonder, is there a chance that the IPA is still drying off? Right, rather than letting you just sit through this for ages, I'm just going to keep on doing this to try and work out what the problem is, because it's, uh, it's still hit and miss now. Right, well, it definitely seems to be working a lot more than it did before. I would say like eight or nine times out of ten it's working. I wonder when we put the rest of the screws in, whether it's going to kind of pull it all together and then make it work 10 times out of 10. Just 
you know what? I think I'm happy with that. I mean, I will do a further test when it's all uh, screwed up. But look at that. It's working time after time. Right, I'm going to try an RF now and see if we have any picture on RF, see if that's improved at all. I can't see how it would have, but uh, let me double check. That's not actually bad for this TV, because I know RF on this TV looks pretty bad anyway. I think that looks better than it did before. I know it's not as good as AV, but you wouldn't expect it to be anyway. I think it would be worth me trying this on another... Uh, on another TV because I'm pretty sure RF on this TV is always a bit iffy. I don't want to fault find a fault that's not there, do you know what I mean? So let's uh, let's bring this down onto another TV and see what the RF looks like on that. Right okay I'm on a different TV now and this picture is actually surprisingly good. I've compared it to the one underneath uh, which is the working one and basically it looks exactly the same so as you can see now I'm working with my faulty one it's not faulty anymore and if you look at the picture up here you can see that it is, uh, it is nearly as good as AV I'm quite surprised with that but what I had to do is I had to swap the cable so this was the long cable and with the long cable I wasn't getting a picture at all but with a shorter cable I am so obviously it's going to be quite sensitive to uh, the length of the cable so there must have been too much loss on the long thin cable it must have not been very good quality right so all that's left to do now is tidy this up because the game is working the games are working pretty good I've only got two to test and uh, RF's working and AV's working so as far as I'm concerned this NES is working fine so I'm just gonna put it back together and give it a nice little clean up and then we will all be finished now if you're wondering how I got this shortly to work, all I did is, this is the side that goes into the TV, remember this is a UK TV, and this is like a female TV coaxial, so all I did is, I've got one of these adapters which is a male TV coaxial to a male RCA, also known as a phono plug, so I call these RCA, also called phonos, and then uh, what that will do is you plug that into here, and then this bit will go into the TV, and this bit, the RCA, will go into the NES. Right, and interestingly enough, I've gone back on this TV here, and it's perfect. So basically, it was the length of the lead that was causing the problem. So actually, this TV must be able to detect quite weak RF signals, because now, as you can see, it's really nice with the short lead. And the other TVs in the house really struggled on the long lead. Most of them didn't pick it up at all. I've just noticed that there's a nice little mechanism here, so I'm going to put a bit of plastic grease on that. Silly me, I forgot to put on the underneath of it. I'm going to take it all apart again. Also, when you're putting this tray on here beforehand, I was just trying to force it down there. You don't. You bring it forward a bit until it clips down and then you push it back. So before I was just screwing it down there and I was putting pressure on here, but you don't. You bring it forward and then it allows it to drop down and then push it back. Okay, so the NES is all cleaned up now. We'll test that a little bit later. I just want to have a look at this broken power supply, just out of curiosity, just to see if it's anything obvious on the inside. So uh, I've managed to start to loosen. It's like a special kind of bit, but I've managed to do it using long nose pliers. 
Now, just in case you haven't seen my videos before, do not copy what you see in these videos, especially when you're dealing with uh, mains electricity like this, because obviously you can electrocute yourself and you can kill yourself. So don't copy what you see in this video. Right, let's see if we can see anything obvious in here. Now obviously it's unplugged at the moment. Now I'm just going to go across the contacts here just to see if we've got any voltage left in it. So I'm putting my meter to AC. Right, so there's nothing there. And there's nothing there, so it should be safe to work on. Well, not really much I can do with this, but what I can do is I can check for continuity between here and the wires, and I can check for continuity between here and the end here, just in case it is a break in the actual cable itself, which would be quite nice. So let's do that. Okay, so we've got continuity there. And we've got continuity there. So this lead looks okay going into it. Now let's try this one. Okay, I don't have anything there. Now that's interesting. On the outer sheath here, it's not coming up, but on the inner conductor is coming up on both of the wires so I wonder whether this has got I mean the wire itself looks to be fine but I wonder if it's been crushed somewhere Or is it measuring a short because it's gone faulty in the actual winding itself? That would be more likely, wouldn't it? So if I was to cut these wires here, that would prove it, wouldn't it? Because these have all been soldered onto here, you see. So let's snip these wires and see what's happening with it. Right, so my guess is that the winding's gone in here. I mean, it would be great if it was the cable, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Right, so now, if I was to go on the wires here, let's see if we've got continuity now, and then we can test into there and see if they're both, uh, both shorting. So I'm on the, this one here, which I presume is going to be the shield, the outer one. No, it's not. Let's try the inner. No. Nothing there. Let's try this one. No. Oh, hold on. One second. Something's something's not right. Right, multimeter was playing up. Okay, let's go there. Nothing there, so this is going to be the inner one, and it is, and this one should be the outer one. No, it's not. Right, that's interesting. Why is that not coming up? That surely that should be the outer one. It's got the braid here. Right, that's definitely the inner. Now, the thing that's confusing me is it's AC. Does that make a difference as far as testing is concerned? Because why were they both coming up on the inner one and now they're not? Is 
tested. That's the thing that's confusing me. Am I testing this properly or not? Quite a thick cable as well, so I think it would be unlikely for it to just fail. Well, I think what I'm going to do is just off camera, I'm going to hold this onto here, so just wrap this round, and then I'm going to hold this one onto here, and I'm just going to keep wiggling it just along like this just to see if it starts beeping because then I might be able to find the uh, the break. That's if there is a break. I mean, I'm fault finding this. Well, saying that, it's okay. It's just a cable, isn't it? So, you know, it's not AC now. I'm just te testing copper wires. So that says to me that there's definitely an issue. It just depends where the issue is. If it's really close to this blue plug, then it's going to be hard to fix. But if it's close to the other end, then I could just solder it, uh, solder it on. Just cut it back, you see, and then solder it on. I might as well do it all on camera now because I've come this far. <laughs> no, okay. Well, I suppose what we can do is just start cutting bit by bit. I mean, it's junk anyway. I was going to be thrown away, so let's just start cutting it bit by bit and seeing if we can get uh, a contact on it. Yes, excellent, I've got a contact now, brilliant. So there must be a fault in this bit here, maybe where it goes through this strain relief. Right, so look, there, and now let's go on to the inner one. Nothing, we might be able to get this working, you know. And now let's go on to the other cable. Yes, there we go. So now let's test this one again. No, nothing there. Out of curiosity, I'm going to strip this all the way back to see where the the break is because I like because of my telecom background. I kind of like seeing where the breaks are in the in the wires. I'm amazed all that amount of wire has actually broken completely. It's quite thick, it's not like a little headphone cable. Let's use this one to strip it back. Right, so it's intact up to there. Intact to there. Let's keep going. Intact to there. It's going to be where the strain relief is, I bet. There, gone, broken. Look at that. So it's a break in the braid. Now, where exactly did that break? Just, I bet, at the end. There you go. Just at the end of the strain relief, you see. So the strain relief did its job, but then at the end of the strain relief, it broke. So now we should be able to fix this, shouldn't we? Because it was the braid onto this side here and the black wire onto here, and I feel safe doing that, and I don't think I'm gonna cause any damage at all because I'm just soldering onto that. So, I know I said earlier I didn't feel confident, but I definitely do feel confident on this now. And I've still got plenty of lead left as well. We've still got about one meter, near enough two meters I would say. I'm wondering if there's a way I can use this strain relief again. Now it's melted on. So that's the problem. How am I gonna, unless I buy another strain relief, I don't really like messing with 240 volts here. You know, I want it to be perfect. And I don't think if I buy a strain relief, it's gonna be perfect. Unless there's a way that I can 
heat this up. I wonder if I heated it up, would it? Let's cut it here. The old cable. I wonder if I heated it up, would it expand a little bit to allow me to get the old cable out? There we go, that's come out. Look. There. So now if I can get the new one through. Yes, and I can get the new one through. I will be able to get that through, I reckon. It's working its way through. Starting to peek his head out. Now I don't mind if I damage the cable here because I'm going to be pulling it all through anyway. So I'll put it through onto a good bit. There you go, I've got it through. Excellent, so now you see I can play with this bit here, cut this old bit off, so the bit I was crushing has now gone, and now I'm working on fresh cable again. There you go. Right, so you can see I've stripped them back now, so now I have to put the white wire to this side, the black wire to this side. So I'm going to be unsoldering this. Right, there we go, so that's the old one off, and they just wrapped it round and then soldered it all on. So let's do exactly the same. So it went on the front here. Now let's cover this fully in solder. Right, I'm very happy with how that went there, so now let's do the same on the other side here. So let's unsolder this old one. There you go, that's off. Let's do exactly the same this side. Right, there we go, that's thick with solder there now. Right, okay, so I'm going to have it like that there. And uh, when the screw comes up here, it's already going to be in this one here. So there's no danger of that touching against the terminal there. Right, okay, let's uh, pop this back on. Right, I was wondering which way it goes round, but luckily it doesn't fit the wrong way. So now I just have to do these two up, and I've got a feeling that this is going to be working just fine. Right, that side's nice and tight, I'm going to do the other side, and then I'm going to go on to this side again, but there's no movement on that side now. This one is cross-threading, it's not going in nice, so I'm going to take it out and start again. Right, okay, that is on nice and solid listen i'm happy with that just before we turn it on let's change over this 13 amp fuse over to a 3 amp fuse
Okay, so here we have our three amp. Plug it in there. Let's just quickly test it, make sure it's all working. Yep. And pop that into here. Okay. And the cables feel like they're in very well. So let's plug it in and see what we have on the end of it. And let's go there. And here. There we go. 11 volts. What a result. Fantastic. So remember when it goes in there, the, the, uh, there's no load on it at the moment. So although it says it's outputting, was it 9 volts? Yeah, there's no load, so hopefully when the load goes on it, it will output 9 volts. So I'll tell you what, let's remove the power supply we have been using, and let's go with the faulty power supply now. So basically everything is going to be faulty on this thing here. It's going to be all the original equipment. So let's see how it performs. I'll tell you what, I'm well happy with that adapter there, really. In fact, I'm more happy with that than I am with the actual NES itself. So uh, I really enjoyed doing that fault finding on that one, finding the wire. I didn't dream that that thick wire there would be enough to fray, especially when the outer sheath was okay. So it just shows you what flexing off the wire does eventually. Actually, I need to put, uh, put the games in. Let's see if it's all working okay. So let's turn on the TV. We'll check for AV and RF as well. Right, at the moment we're on AV, so let's pop in Duck Hunt, let's go all the way in, nice and firmly, down, turn on. There we go, Duck Hunt's working, and let's do Pro-Am, all the way in, down, turn on. That's that one, and now let's do the RF. Input, and how good is this on the faulty adapter, which is no longer faulty. So let's do Duck Hunt again, all the way in, down, Yep, yeah, there it is, and reset it. Yep. Yeah. And now let's plug this in and do a tiny bit of gameplay. All the way in, down, turn on. Fantastic. Oh, what a nice result. I mean, I was already happy with it, but now the fact that the adapter's working is just absolutely amazing. And the RF as well is working just as well as the AV, which is nice to see, because I wasn't sure. I thought this TV might be a bit bad on the RF. I used to love this game when I was when I was a, a teenager. I think I can't remember what I had it on. I'm I'm thinking it must have been the Sega Master System because I never had the NES. Either that or it have been the Spectrum. I'm sure it was the I'm sure it was the Sega Master System. But anything to do with radio control cars, I, I loved. So there we go. What a fantastic fix. Really happy with this one. And especially, like I said, the power adapter. I've really enjoyed that. Okay, so that is it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more trying to fix videos. Take care. Thanks so much. Bye now.